Hey, Annie, guess what? What? We just launched a business of biotech newsletter. Yeah? Yeah. I know what you're thinking. What am I thinking? We don't need another <laughs> newsletter. Yeah, I might have been thinking that. Annie, I swear on my grandpa's grave, you're going to like this newsletter. That's a pretty bold swear, Matt. Uh, hear me out. It's monthly. Only once a month. It's ad-free. And it's modeled after the Business of Biotech podcast. It's got the same insight from the builders of biotech that you see in the podcast. So what's not to like? That actually sounds like it doesn't suck. Pretty high praise, Annie. Check it out. Bioprocessonline.com backslash B-O-B. Go there and sign up for this newsletter. You won't regret it. Welcome back to the Business of Biotech. I'm Matt Piller. And while it's common for my guests on the show to traverse two or maybe three environs of the life sciences landscape before leading a biopharma company, my guest on today's show has done just about all of it. He's a practicing cardiologist, an attending at Montefiore Medical Center, and a teaching attending at Mount Sinai School of Medicine. He's worked at Taro, Pfizer, and Daiichi Sankayo for 26 years. He was an attending faculty physician at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And today, he's chief medical officer at Zalud Therapeutics, a late-stage biopharma targeting chronic inflammatory conditions with a non-viral gene therapy and leading with osteoarthritis of the knee. His name is Dr. Howard Rutman, and I'm honored to spend some time with him today. Dr. Rutman, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you, Matt. Uh, pleasure to be here. It's our pleasure to have you. Um, and as I as I kind of rolled out there in, in the intro, uh, you're a man of, of, of many disciplines within this space. You've been and remain a practicing cardiologist. You've been and remain an academic as a teaching attending. Uh, you've worked for big pharma, you've worked for industry, and now you work in emerging biopharma. So uh, I'll start with the, the, the big question on everyone's mind. Is there anything even left on the, on the bucket list for you in, in this life sciences space? What, what, uh, what box haven't you checked yet? Uh, thank you, Matt. Professionally, uh, I'm not seeking a destination. Rather, I'm on an ongoing journey. Um, you've highlighted many of my uh, past uh, professional uh, roles and, and uh, leading up to my current role as chief medical officer uh, at Salute Therapeutics. Uh, the opportunity at Salute Therapeutics is really to leverage all of those previous experiences uh, and to uh, create therapies using uh, 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 that would address inflammation and neuroinflammation, uh, looking at diseases like osteoarthritis and ALS. Uh, the, the common thread through all of this is a desire to make uh, an impact on the lives of patients. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and the, so it's interesting to me if I, as, as I kind of outlined, as I, as I walk through the very high highlights of, of your CV, you're working now for this company, Zalud, that's developing gene therapies that regulate the cytokine system for uh, patients with chronic inflammatory conditions, like, as you said, osteoarthritis and neuropathic pain. Um, you joined this company uh, back in, I think, the spring of 2021, if I'm not mistaken. And on paper, it looks like it's a pretty significant departure from where you spent your time, the bulk of your career to date uh, in cardiology and the vasculature in general. So um, I'm curious about that. Take us take us behind the the why. You know, what's what's the why behind that shift? Uh, so inflammation is common to a, a wide range of diseases, diseases of the joint, cardiovascular disease, uh, gastrointestinal, skin, eye, and, and diseases of the central nervous system. Uh, there are clear connections between inflammation and cardiovascular disease. Uh, the link between uh, HSCRP uh, and, and atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease has been known for some time. Uh, and trials uh, using monoclonal antibodies to IL-1 show that, that you impact the progression of cardiovascular disease as well as the progression of osteoarthritis. So there is a connection uh, through, the, through inflammation. But for me, there's also a, a, a broader uh, connection between the two. Uh, cardiovascular disease is a disease of a large population. Uh, it has a significant burden on, on patients' lives. Uh, and 
Throughout the course of my career, there's been a significant advancement in the treatment of patients with cardiovascular disease uh, through the development of new therapeutics, new devices. Patients with cardiovascular disease uh, do much better now than they did at the beginning of my career. The same cannot necessarily be said for osteoarthritis. It is also a disease of a, of a large population. It also has a large burden of, of illness. Uh, but unlike cardiovascular disease, there really have not been any new therapies developed for many years. Uh, what what uh, people rely on are, are uh, uh, drugs that were developed years ago, some of which uh, do not have durable efficacy or, or uh, have safety challenges. What's really missing is a drug that, that has uh, durable efficacy, uh, broad safety, and, and can alter the course of, of the disease. So there's, great, there's a great opportunity uh, within the inflammatory space uh, in osteoarthritis. Yeah, very good. Um, the, the, the therapeutic space that you're in now, tell me about that. Tell me about that re relative to, you know, wh where you spent the bulk of your career to date. Um, so it's a, a, a DNA-based gene, gene therapy, if, I, if I'm not mistaken. You can explain that in more detail for us. But this entire, like any, anything, you know, that uh, starts with, with any letter has N-A in it and then ends with perhaps another letter is super white hot right now, right? Nu nucleic acid uh, therapeutics are, are incredib incredibly um, hot right now. So is this your first blush in, in this arena or do you have some experience coming out of the, the cardio space uh, with, with this modality? Uh, so uh, believe it or not, my, my academic background is actually in uh, nucleic acids. Uh, mm -hmm. I uh, studied DNA and RNA uh, tumor viruses. Uh, I worked at places like Cold Spring Harbor Laboratories, Harvard, Rockefeller University, uh, and uh, had the opportunity to work with many of the pioneering molecular biologists uh, as nucleic acid science was, was developed. Uh, my professional career uh, uh, sort of parallels the development within the pharmaceutical industry. I started uh, at Tara Pharmaceuticals, as you mentioned, in, in uh, small molecules. Uh, I then went to Pfizer, where, which was my first uh, introduction to biologics, working on monoclonal antibody biosimilars. Uh, I then went to Daiichi Sankyo, where I had the opportunity to go in antibody drug conjugates. So that's yet one step beyond uh, uh, monoclonal antibodies. And now, as you say, I'm, I'm in Zulu Therapeutics, where, where our focus is uh, nucleic acid, uh, DNA delivered by, as a plasmid uh, for therapeutics uh, in, in inflammatory. So I've sort of followed the trajectory of the, of the industry going into, as you say, nucleic acids are very, very hot. And um, uh, having an opportunity to do this at Salute gives me an opportunity to, to, to really follow the, that trajectory, but also brings me back to my origins in molecular biology. Yeah. Was that um, that progression? It's interesting. I, you know, I've I've interviewed hundreds of, uh, of biopharma leaders, and I don't know that I've I've talked to one yet who it's it probably has happened. We just haven't had the discussion. But I don't know that I've talked with one yet who's you know kind of walked through that progression from small mall to you know the the therapy du jour, right? Uh, that, that we're looking at right now uh, around nucleic acids. Was that progression in, intentional on your part? Was it choreographed at all, orchestrated, uh, or, or was it just sort of sort of happenstance and opportunity? Uh, no, I, I think that, that there was some, um, in each of these transitions, I think there was some thought and, and direction. Um, you know, I, I did want to, when I took the opportunity at Pfizer to go into the monoclonal antibodies, I did see that that biologics were becoming having a, a greater role in in therapeutics and um, and and really um, immunology and, and inflammation oncology. Uh, so I, I think I, I did see that. And then likewise, making the transition to Zalud, uh, the opportunity to work on on uh, DNA and and uh, gene based therapy. As you say, I think it is the the a new treatment paradigm, cell and, and, and gene therapy, uh, is certainly up and coming, and uh, it was, gives me an opportunity to to learn new things and and uh, really uh, be at the forefront of, of of therapeutic modalities. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting. I, I, and I was going to ask you, so before I, before you revealed, like I said, this, this chronology, right. This, uh, the, the leaps that you've taken from one modality to the next, um, I was, I was going to ask you specifically about the leap into D in, into DNA therapeutics. Um, what was most challenging or perhaps what you were least prepared for in that transition. But I'm going to spin that question just a little bit. And I'm going to ask you to maybe offer some advice to, to folks who are in similar positions or have opportunities similar to those that you had uh, to, to move into new and more complex uh, and challenging uh, modalities um, around what, what you've learned from each of those transitions, maybe like what, what have you learned along each of those leaps that, uh, that you think would be fitting, I guess, advice or uh, insight for, for folks who are so, you know, I, one of the things that, I, that I've said, and, I, and people often approach me, you know, for advice about their careers in the pharmaceutical industry or people transitioning into from, from clinical careers into, into industry come to me and ask me, you know, for insights. And one of the things that I say is you should never go into a position under the assumption that you know everything you will need to do to be successful in that position. Otherwise, why, why are you trying something new? What's, what's the attraction? I mean, I, I always view the opportunity to come into a new role as an opportunity to learn more, to be, there'll be a learning curve, but it, it's always an opportunity uh, to learn more and, and to expand one's, one's repertoire. So I, I feel that that's, one shouldn't approach a, a, a new position from a, a a sense of, of, well, you know, am I going to be able to, to master this or, you know, but, but rather this is what makes this a great opportunity is that I have the opportunity to learn and, and, to, and, to, and to do new things. Now, coming into the world of biotech, um, you know, that's a, that's a transition in and of itself. Um, you know, uh, the world of biotech, uh, you, you, um, uh, you wear many hats, you do a lot of different things. Um, it involves, you know, you leverage your previous experiences, but you have to be a, a leader in clinical development, you know, be aware of regulatory communications, strategy, investment. So it's, it's a very, it's a different world, but it's, it's an exciting world. Um, you know, one of the things that I've seen in, in the biotech world that, that I find very uh, learning uh, experience for me was was to see the the connection between uh, the investment world and and, and the biotech world. Uh, I think that you know I always worked, for example, at larger public companies. Uh, in those public companies, you know the shareholders are involved really through the through the board and, and through the financial press, but they're but they're not as as intimately involved and, and, and not as, as engaged uh, in the biotech world, you know, uh, really the investment decisions and, and the science that goes along with it are very closely linked. And there's, and there's a lot of, uh, uh, of uh, it, it focuses your decisions and, and, and really helps you make uh, very informed decisions. Yeah. So there's a, there's a there's a lot to there there are a lot of things to be learned uh, in that transition into into the biotech world. For sure, especially new new and emerging, you know, small small biotech. How give us a just a a, a quick kind of snapshot of Zalud from a, a a scope and size perspective. Um, yeah, yeah. So um, you know, Zalud has uh, around twenty uh, uh, people. Um, you know. Uh, Really good leadership. A, a lot of the leadership has has uh, significant uh, big pharma experience, which is very helpful. Uh, and but but all of us are uh, very uh, committed to to doing um, to stretching, and 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 that stretching is important. You know, people may uh, uh, have had experience with with. Uh, one area of the regulatory world, but now have to cover the entire regulatory world or your, or your clinical development from, from, you know, phase one all the way through to phase three. So you really do have to stretch. Um, and, and the Zulu team really gets along very well uh, and, and leverages all of that uh, experience and, and knowledge base. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you, uh, this is another, another follow-up. I'm, I'm going to 
I'm, I'm going to re rewind real quick back to, uh, you know, a couple of things I mentioned. One, one that you remain a, a practicing cardiologist and, and also uh, teaching attending. Um, why, why do you do that? Why do, why do you still uh, practice medicine? Um, well, <laughs> I, sh I should ask why and how. <laughs> like, how do you, how do you manage? Well, so um, you you mentioned that I that I do have a teaching role, and and that teaching role is something that's very important to me. I think it keeps me connected to uh, emerging uh, uh, minds and emerging thought in in um, in the medical space, and you know by by. You always learn from the people you teach, and 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 the ability to to teach uh, gives me the connection to the hospital world, to the to the practice world, and that's very important in in my capacity. I I think that I can relate better to our clinical investigators. I can relate better to to our to I can bring a practice perspective to clinical trials and to clinical development that really results from the fact that, that I am a clinician and and, uh, uh, and and the ability to to be stay remain connected to the clinical world is important to me yeah yeah no I can I mean that's certainly understandable and I can respect it I just you know uh, <laughs> I'm concerned about you, Dr. Rutman. That's a lot to chew. <laughs> uh, no, I, it, it really, it, it, it inspires me. In fact, uh, you know, I, um, uh, during the, the uh, COVID lockdown period, we, we um, uh, they, they suspended some of the, of the teaching activities because, you know, the, as you would expect, there were, there were demands on the hospital and the hospital staff and when they were able to reinstate uh, the teaching role and, and going to the hospital once a week, meeting with, meeting with uh, uh, you know, medical students, and, and you know, again, being a, serving as a mentor, giving them an example of, of you know, various career choices that I've made, and also talking about you know, some of the, the research that I had done, you know, clinical research in cardiovascular disease that, that I had done you know, over the years. Um, uh, it really, it really does. It was great to be able to come back to to the to the um, hospital setting and to the teaching role. It, it meant a lot to me. Yeah, well, that's a, that's awesome. That's excellent work. Um, so I want to I want to shift gears here a little bit and uh, and get back to Zalud and talk about some of the indications that you're pursuing um, and 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 why, like aligning those indications with the specific therapy. So um, why is a, a plasmid DNA gene therapy expressing Zalud's proprietary IL-10V, a plausible therapy for, uh, well, osteoarthritis of the knee and, and other indications you're pursuing? Uh, so Zalud is, pr is pursuing um, uh, inflammatory conditions and neuroinflammatory conditions with our plasmid-based uh, therapy. Uh, XT150 is our lead uh, product, and, and the indication is osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, it does express uh, IL-10V, our proprietary version of IL-10. And we've chosen IL-10 because IL-10 is, uh, is a master regulator of the cytokine system. It is upstream of many other uh, uh, inflammatory processes, so it can control multiple different uh, processors. It, processes. It downregulates pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines and allows restoration of joint uh, homeostasis. So a lot, a lot of re good reason uh, to target IL-10. The challenge with using IL-10 is that IL-10, uh, when given in the bloodstream systemically, has a short half-life and doesn't really get to the site of action. And there's the beauty of our plasmid-based therapy. Our plasmid-based therapy delivers the, the gene for the IL-10 into the local environment where it is necessary. In the case of knee osteoarthritis, it's in, um, it's in the knee joint. And uh, the cells that, that pick up the, uh, the plasmid DNA are the effector cells, are the cells that are, that are um, that need to be uh, influenced by that IL-10. 
So we're giving it in a local in a local uh, environment, and it has we're leveraging the cells that need that need to uh, to uh, to take up that DNA and and produce the IL ten. One of the things that we've talking we've spoken about the the gene therapy and 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 how gene therapy is really um, uh, taken off. As you know, most of the gene therapy uh, uses viral vectors, um, mm -hmm. and uh, the Zalud approach is to use a naked DNA plasmid. And there are advantages to using a naked DNA plasmid uh, because of, because it's a naked plasmid. We don't have off-target effects, and we don't uh, elicit an immune response. So that gives us the opportunity to use it uh, on more than one occasion to give repeat injections, which is a bit of a challenge with some of the viral vectors. Um, so we have a, um, a gene therapy by a naked plasmid that can be administered locally into the knee. It overcomes um, the, the uh, systemic uh, concerns, and it also uh, acts locally uh, where it's needed. Why, um, why, why, the, why the knee? So, you know, if you think about uh, inflammation, particularly inflammation of the joints, as you mentioned, I mean, inflammation, is, you know, it's a, it's a non-discriminating, it doesn't discriminate which tissue necessarily it, it uh, wants to affect. Um, but as it relates to joint inflammation, you know, I mean, I'm 47 years old, and recently I've been waking up with a lot of stiffness in my shoulders of all places. I haven't been doing any heavy lifting. It's almost like I, I need to, you know, Dr. Google tells me I have frozen shoulder. I don't know, like a lot of kind of locked up, right? The shoulders, you know, the knees get stiff, the ankles get stiff. Uh, you know, wh why is, is there a specific alignment between what you're doing and, and the knee or is it based more on market opportunity? I'm just curious why OA? So, so you're absolutely right that that the um, osteoarthritis is very common and it does affect potentially other joints. Uh, the knee uh, is the most common, uh, but knees, hips, shoulders um, are, are are certainly uh, impacted by osteoarthritis. And it, as you've mentioned, it, it is a large indication with a large burden of of illness. What? Um, but but we're also thinking about inflammation in, in a totally different um, uh, from a totally different perspective, and that's neuroinflammation. So neuroinflammation, um, neuroinflammatory, neurodegenerative, neuroinflammatory conditions uh, include things like MS and ALS, and we have some data, uh, preclinical data on. Uh, MS and, and, and ALS. Uh, you mentioned neuropathic pain. Uh, we, we have a small uh, clinical trial in, in patients with neuropathic pain showing that it's safe to administer uh, our plasmid. This is into the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, but um, I think the biggest opportunity for neuroinflammation may actually be uh, with a disease like ALS, it's not it's not a uh, common disease like osteoarthritis of the knee, but it is it is a disease with a tremendous unmet um, need, and and we're we're doing uh, right now uh, some of the uh, pharmacology and safety studies necessary to begin a, a full clinical program in ALS. Mm -hmm. So to get back to your your comment, I think that that there are a lot of opportunities with inflammation. For us, the 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 uh, one of the advantages is to do it in a localized space. So mm -hmm. the knee, for example, or the cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, one of the challenges with um, naked plasmids is that they don't they aren't taken up as well as as viral vectors. So we use the fact that it's in a confined space to uh, encourage the uh, the cells to pick up that DNA. We also have a specific formulation that leverages the cell's natural ability to take up DNA as a way of taking up the plasmid. So we're, we're leveraging the, the, the uptake of the DNA, the local space. So places like knee osteoarthritis, cerebrospinal fluid are, are good targets for us. When you're striving to excel in a new arena, the best guides are the ones already doing it well. 
The business of biotech brings those voices forward to help new and emerging biopharmas turn their innovations like mRNA and cell and gene therapies into clinical realities. Tune in and subscribe for insights on hiring, regulatory, and other need-to-know topics for biopharma leaders. The podcast is brought to you in collaboration with Cytiva. Check out their resources at cytiva.com backslash emerging biotech. That's C-Y-T-I-V-A dot com backslash emerging biotech. On the flip side of that, I'm going to bounce around here a little bit because so you, contextually, you, you brought this up, the, the why behind uh, be, behind pursuing osteoarthritis of the knee and that localized approach. Uh, it all makes sense. Uh, on the flip side of that, though, Zalud is a, a small company. Um, and when I talk to a lot of sp- small uh, gene therapy companies and, and DNA and RNA uh, companies, AT- ATMPs in general. Um, the majority of the time when I, when I spend time on the, on, on the, you know, on the podcast with these folks, they're working on rare diseases, in some cases, ul- ultra rare diseases strategically, you know, because it's a, it enables a small, very concerted effort to, to focus on a very, you know, specific thing, a very rare disease. And on the, production and manufacturing side, uh, should they get to that point, even, even clinical and, and, and beyond, um, it's, it's small and controlled, right? You don't need to produce a whole bunch of stuff to, to treat giant populations. Um, so I'm curious about that from Zalud's perspective, you know, should you, you're, you're, you're pretty advanced clinically. Uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but, um, should you move into, you know, closer to commercialization? Should you get to a point where this is a readily available treatment for the, I don't know, you tell me millions, millions, billions globally? I don't know, people who have uh, OA and other inflammatory conditions that this could be uh, effective for. How does, how does little mighty Zalud manage that trajectory? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, you're right. Osteoarthritis is a common disease. Uh, a large population, uh, 30 million uh, people suffer from osteoarthritis uh, in, in the United States. Uh, I think that you're, you're absolutely um, correct that, that Zalud's vision is to uh, be a gene therapy that is applicable to broad uh, populations. Uh, as you pointed out, we've seen recently with the mRNA viruses that, uh, uh, with the mRNA vaccines rather, that that uh, there's an opportunity to do uh, uh, nucleic acid therapy uh, in a broad population, and and Salute certainly feels that that that's a, an opportunity uh, to bring gene therapy to a large population. You're absolutely correct that many of the other companies. Um, in the space are, are working on uh, rare diseases and uh, usually uh, single point mutations. And, and I think that those are very worthwhile programs. There's certainly an unmet need there. The concept behind um, XT150 is a little different than, than those types of gene therapies. Those gene therapies are meant to correct something that, that is, that is an, an, an error in the, in the gene of um, of uh, somebody who has who has this condition, uh, XT150 and IL10 work differently. IL10, uh, we know that 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 patients who are experiencing painful arthritis have low levels of IL10, and what we're doing with our gene therapy is providing an additional source of IL10. So this is something that that can supplement the body's own IL-10 and at the local site, um, uh, reduce inflammation and and, um, uh, turn back that pro-inflammatory state. But one of the other things about uh, about our gene therapy and, and, and osteoarthritis is a consideration of the safety. Because as you go to a very large population, safety concerns become very important. And what we've seen um, in our preclinical studies, as well as in our early clinical studies, is that XT150 has a, a very uh, attractive safety profile. And, it's a, and, and what is needed for osteoarthritis is a, a treatment that can be applied to a broad population and that this would be perhaps an older population, a population that's on 
has concomitant um, uh, medications and comorbidities. So uh, I, the safety profile is extremely important. So you're right, um, uh, Zalud has taken the approach of, of really going um, for a large indication, a little bit against the, the, the current, if you will. But um, you know, we think that the, the safety profile that we have with XT150, the unmet need with osteoarthritis disease that has a tremendous burden on, on pain and function and, and the lives of patients, we think that this is the right opportunity to bring gene therapy to a large population. Yeah. Can you, um, another question on that, and then I want to get back to, I, I, I want to get a little bit better an understanding of uh, the, the modified proprietary approach to IL-10, because I think that's important. And I'm not entirely clear on it, so I'm hoping you clear it up. But while we're talking about uh, the, the patient population and the trajectory, um, can you speak at all to how Zalud plans to uh, to manufacture, right? Like it, it, you know, should should you get to that point where you've got these thirty million patients in the United States who uh, could benefit from your therapy? What does that look like from a manufacturing standpoint? And will Zalud at, at that point? Um, may, maybe you can't speak to this <laughs> just yet, but will Zalud be a running point on on that manufacturing? So, uh, you know, to be fair, I, I'm not the subject matter expert on manufacturing. We have a, an excellent chief technology officer who could give you a better uh, answer on that. What I can tell you is that over the 18 months that I've been uh, with Salud, we've made uh, significant strides. We've gone from our initial research uh, manufacturing process to a manufacturing process that would be applicable to late stage clinical trials, as well as to um, commercial product. Uh, we're doing that by partnering on the drug substance, on the drug product, as well as uh, on, on the pack and label uh, for the for the uh, manufactured product. Um, we're working with well-known uh, uh, leaders in the field who have the skill and experience necessary to, to manufacture these biologics. Uh, I can say that we've we've uh, brought it to regulators both in the United States and the EU just in terms of looking at our process and looking at how we plan to approach it. Um, they've been aligned uh, with, with our approach, which uh, helps de-risk um, the, the, the program going forward. But uh, as I say, I think we have a great team uh, at Salud, both on the, on the uh, technology side, on the regulatory side that will, that will get us to a point that we can um, supply the, the, the product um, on a broad scale. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is there any, any way to even, uh, project what the, that scale might look like? What, like what kind of capacity you might need to meet a, a, com a commercial demand? You know, I, 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 as I said, I think that this is something that would be, uh, you know, broadly applicable. You know, we're, we are thinking about large populations. I, I would prefer not to make a, um, commercial projection, you know, at this particular point. Uh, that's you know. fair. I put you on the spot. That's entirely fair. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Uh, I, I want to jump back to that, that IL-10 discussion, because I do want some clarity on, on, on the modified variant of IL-10, this IL-10V. Um, so can, can you just give me some, I guess, color on that? How, what's, what's proprietary about it? How is it, how is it put together? How is it modified? Totally. So, so you're right that the IL-10V uh, is an important component of, uh, of uh, what makes uh, XT150 uh, special and, and why it has uh, these pro uh, proprietary capabilities. Uh, I think that uh, what we're looking for is something that has a, a durable response. And uh, the, what we've seen in our preclinical models, as well as in our clinical models, is that durability. Uh, in clinical models, we in clinical trials, what we've seen is that patients who've received two injections um, have sustained benefits in terms of pain and function, lasting out to a year after the initial injection. Mm. Uh, what the why behind that? There are three reasons behind the durable response. One is that we're giving it as a plasmid and. Uh, the, we know that the plasmid remains present in the joint for six months 
uh, following uh, an injection. So we have a sustained local delivery of the plasmid. As you pointed out, we're using IL-10V, which is our proprietary version of IL-10. It is modified from wild-type IL-10 by a single amino acid substitution at uh, amino acid residue 129, uh, which is in the hinge region of the molecule. And what we've been able to show in preclinical models is it has a more durable um, activity than the wild-type version of IL-10. So what we're doing is we're giving the, the, IL, the, the plasmid with sustained uh, transgene expression for six months and uh, the uh, longer duration of action from the IL-10V. And the idea is to reset the cytokine system and restore homeostasis. And by doing that over a sustained period of time, we get that durable effect uh, on, on pain and on function and the possibility of, of a disease altering the course of the disease. Yeah, that's, yeah, pretty incredible. Um... Pretty incredible results so far. Uh, can, can you give me any any color on how uh, this IL ten V was 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 discovered or developed? Was it uh, so? Uh, it was um, there. There was a part of the molecular biology of synthesizing IL ten. Uh, certain variants um, came uh, uh, became a bit, uh, known, and and when they were tested in the preclinical models, they were shown to have. Uh, more durable efficacy, um, lasting out to, to several months. So uh, I think that that was an unexpected finding, and 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 that was really the basis of uh, of going forward with the IL, with the, the proprietary version of IL ten. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So give us uh, give us some some clinical updates. What's what's in the in the what's on the clinical horizon for Zalud right now? So uh, we've uh, concluded uh, three uh, phase one a, a B two A studies and have recently completed uh, a large two hundred eighty six patient phase two B study. Uh, that study uh, was in patients with moderate to severe osteoarthritis of the knee. Uh, we had the ability to uh, to look at uh, three different dosages, and uh, we we are. We are uh, analyzing those results right now. And with those uh, results are planning our next um, uh, study in uh, knee osteoarthritis. In the meantime, we are uh, conducting a 72 patient study in facet joint osteoarthritis. Now facet joint osteoarthritis is a relatively common uh, cause of back pain. And we are studying it uh, in patients with arthritis with inflammation of those joints between the vertebra and the lower spine. Um, the reason that this is an important study is that first of all, there's an unmet need for patients with, with facet joint osteoarthritis. Can you uh, also, just real quick, Dr. Rutman, that facet joint, can you, can you spell that for me? I'm, I'm just curious. F-A-C-E-T. F-A-C-E-T, facet joint. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, is this uh, is this a singular joint in the lower back, or are there multiple facet no, joints? No, no. Every every two vertebra are, have a, have facet have a bilateral facet joints between them. So, um, so for example, uh, we're looking at um, L four L five, so lumbar disc four to five. There's a, there are two joints, one on the right, one on the left, between those two. And then L five S one, so between the fifth lumbar and the and uh, the sacral, again there are two joints on 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 either side. The, the 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 joints that are most commonly impacted by facet jo uh, joint osteoarthritis are in the lumbar region and in the cervical region. We're not studying the cervical region right now, but we are studying the the the. Uh, lumbar region, and it is a uh, a relatively common um, cause of of, um, of low back pain, mm -hmm. different than than you know, let's say um, uh, herniated disc. I mean, this is this is a different condition, 
but it is a true um, arthritis. It is a true inflammation of the joint. Uh, and the way we're studying it is by bilateral injections, uh, an injection on the right and an injection on the left. And what we're studying is a, a dosage that we think will be applicable to, to our next knee osteoarthritis is, uh, study as well. So we're studying multiple doses and we are studying it um, with a repeat injection 90 days after the first injection. So that study is ongoing. Um, uh, it's enrolling very well and, and we're hopeful uh, to, to get results uh, towards the end of 2023. Uh, and uh, uh, end of 23, beginning of 24. And, and, um, and, uh, we, uh, and we are using that along with our previous knee osteoarthritis studies to plan our, our future studies in osteoarthritis. I think I also mentioned that, that we have, have a little bit of experience with injections into the cerebrospinal fluid with neuropathic pain. Uh, that, that study um, has... Uh, um, has given us uh, some safety uh, information. And we are doing uh, preclinical uh, safety and pharmacology work uh, with the idea of, of going into our next indication, which will probably be ALS. Um, uh, so that, that's uh, an upcoming indication for us. Great. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you another follow-up question in keeping with the anatomical physiology uh, lesson that, that we're getting about uh, facet joints. Um, neuropathic pain. So you talked about the, you know, that, that early work there. Um, de describe that for us. So like I, what, what, uh, what constitutes neuropathic pain? What, to, to what, like to what effect? So, uh, so neuropathic pain um, uh, is, is a broad description of different types of, of pain that are not necessarily the, the pain that you initially experience um, when, when uh, you know, let's say when you, when you uh, have an injury of some kind, mm -hmm. that, that pain, uh, no susceptive pain or, or is, is pain that, that comes from, from uh, an acute injury. But with a time, there can be a chronification of pain and the, and the pain continues beyond the point where the actual injury is still there. So examples of uh, neuropathic uh, pain include um, uh, the one that we started with, which is lumbosacral radiculopathy, sciatica type pain, uh, but but other ones are diabetic peripheral neuropathic pain. So there, there's a there's a, a metabolic reason uh, for the, for the neuropathic pain, or uh, you know uh, shingles post herpetic neuralgia um, is another. Uh, fortunately, we're not seeing as much of that anymore because many people are getting vaccinated for 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 um, uh, for shingles. But um, uh, you know those are all examples of neuropathic pain, uh, which is different than, than sort of the acute pain that one feels during an injury. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Uh, taking, like, like I said, taking big swings, even, even some of these sort of follow on uh, explorations Zalud is doing are in indications that have giant patient populations. It's pretty intriguing to watch. Well, you, you, I think you you uh, uh, understand uh, the Zalud mentality. We we do come uh, many of us from from big pharma. Uh, we've worked on big indications. Uh, we like the science and we like the ability to to impact uh, you know many patients' lives. I, I think that was that was how we started this conversation. Was you know what what is it that that motivates me and and going forward? And you know I I think that that's. That's really sums it up is, is the ability to do something that's gonna be meaningful and impactful on, on many patients um, using the, the, the new science, using the, the, you know, the state of the art um, uh, modalities, but really bringing them to, to large populations uh, where there really is unmet need, uh, osteoarthritis, a, a pop, uh, uh, painful uh, uh, conditions, as well as as well as you know, even 
if they're not as large an, uh, an indication, patients with, with severe uh, uh, you know, progressive neurodegenerative diseases such as ALS. So these are, these are meaningful uh, and important indications and ones that I'm, I'm proud to be able to, to work with my Zalud colleagues to really help develop new therapies. Yeah. Well, it's excellent work. And I, uh, I appreciate the time you've given me, Dr. Rutman, on, on many fronts. You know, it's like, like you said, alluding back to the beginning of the conversation, I talked about the fact that you're a clinician, a, a teacher, you know, you've worked in industry, you've worked in, in biopharma, small and large. And I think the questions I've asked you have pulled from each one of those <laughs> at various points in the conversation, we've pulled from each one of those disciplines or experiences you've had. And, uh, and I'm appreciative of that. Well, thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, you know, I, as I say, I think that that it, my career has has um, touched on on a lot of different um, uh, parts of the healthcare world, and, and and you know, I remain a committed physician, uh, always uh, trying to 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 help alleviate uh, conditions for for patients, and that's that's my focus, and and. You know, along with my salute colleagues, we have great opportunity. Yep, very good. Well, we will uh, we'll be following along with the journey, and uh, hopefully, a little bit down the road, and we've got some some clinical data to share and some progress made. We'll we'll have you and uh, you mentioned your your chief scientific officer uh, or chief chief technical officer, I believe, when I asked the manufacturing question. Uh, you know, maybe we'll get him or her on the show as well to talk about the go forward plan on the manufacturing front, but. Um, in the meantime, keep up the good work. It's been a pleasure talking with you, Dr. Rutman. Well, thank you. I appreciate it, man. So that's Zalud Therapeutics, Dr. Howard Rutman. I'm Matt Piller, and this is the Business of Biotech. We're produced by Bioprocess Online in partnership with Cytiva, which readily offers support for emerging biopharma companies at cytiva.com backslash emerging bio. Check out that resource center. And while you're at it, subscribe to the Business of Biotech newsletter. It's a new newsletter at bioprocessonline.com backslash B-O-B. Tell your friends about the podcast. Leave us a review. Leave us some feedback. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>